Hello and welcome to this video on determining the, the intersection or the union of two sets. All right, so this is a, uh, in this video, we'll take a look at a, a few examples where I'm given a couple sets of numbers. Uh, and, you know, they don't have to be sets of numbers, but in my examples, they are. Uh, I'll be given a few sets of numbers and asked to determine what's called the intersection of two of those sets. And in other examples, I'm going to be finding what's called the union of, of two of those sets. And we'll talk about the difference between those. So, to start, my first examples are going to involve these sets of numbers, or just a sim some simple finite sets. Uh, so I have here, let's set, I have a set called A, which is this, this, this collection of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, just those six elements, six whole numbers. Set B is this collection, this set of 1, 3, 5, and 7, just these four elements, four odd whole numbers. And set C, this collection here of 2, 4, 6, and 8, uh, four elements, and uh, all even whole numbers. All right. So in part A, my first example, we're asked to find A intersected with B. That's what this little symbolism means. So I'm going to write that off to the side here. Okay, uh, the intersection Okay, the intersection of two sets Alright, say A and B which is denoted by this symbolism right here, this little upside down U, denoted A intersection B. I might just say the word intersection when I see this symbol, but you could say it in full and say that this is, you know, the intersection of the sets A and B. So the intersection of two sets is another set. So is, uh, is the set containing elements that are in both A and B? Is the set containing elements that are in both set A and, all right, keyword here is and, set B. All right, a lot of words there. Um, some people might call this the overlap as well. Uh, so what I'm asking for is, you know, when, when you're asked for the intersection of two sets, you're looking at the elements in both of those sets and just looking for the elements that they have in common looking for elements that are in both the sets, so set A and set B. And this is a very key word here. When you see this symbol, this upside down U, this intersection symbol, it's really like having the word and there. You know, what elements are in A and B at the same time. Okay, um, so before I get into that, No, actually, let me, yeah, let's just do this. All right, so the set A intersect B is another set, all right? So I'll put the little curly braces. And again, what I'm looking for are the elements in A, the elements in B, and what is in both of them, what is in A and B, all right? So the elements of A are one, two, three, four, five, six. The elements of B are one, three, five, seven. Uh, what's in both of them? Let's see, 1 is in A and B. So that means the number 1 is in A intersect B, or the intersection of A and B, however you want to say that. Uh, 2 is in A, but not in B. There's no 2 in B, so 2 does not belong to the intersection of A and B. 3 is in A, 
3 is also in B, so 3 is in set A and set B. 3 belongs to the intersection of A and B, A intersect B. 4 is in A, but not in B, so 4 does not belong to the intersection of A and B. 5 is in A, and 5 is also in B. So 5 belongs to the intersection of A and B. 6 is in A, but not in B, so 6 does not belong to the intersection. And we've already said that 1, 3, and 5 belong, so I'm not going to look at those in set B, but there's oh, there's 7 in set B, but no 7 in set A, so 7 does not belong to the intersection of A and B. Great, so I've looked at all the elements of each set, and the only elements that belong to both at A and B are 1, 3, and 5, so then I'll close this set here. And that's it. I am uh, totally finished. That's what it means to find the intersection of two sets. Okay, so I have several examples involving you know, these same three sets for a bit. Just sets of finite, you know, a finite number of elements, a nice simple number. Alright, so part B, again, think we're still doing the intersection. Same thing, find the intersection, right, this upside down U symbol, the intersection of A and C. All right, so again, what we're looking for are all the elements in set A and set C at the same time. You know, what elements do they share? So A intersect C, or the intersection of A and C, is itself another set. All right, so I start to uh, draw these little curly braces. Again, I'll, I'll run through the elements of set A and C and see what if, they, if they're in both of these sets. All right. So back, here's A, here's C, right? A has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. C has 2, 4, 6, 8. 1 is in set A, but not in set C. So 1 doesn't belong to the intersection. 2 is in set A and in set C. So 2 belongs to the intersection. 3 is in set A, but not in set C. So 3 does not belong to the intersection. 4 is in set A. And it is also in set C. So 4 belongs to the intersection of A and C. 5 is in set A, but not in set C. So 5 does not belong to the intersection. 6 is in set A. 6 is also in set C. So 6 belongs to the intersection of A and C. And I'm done with the elements of A. Now the elements of C I have 2, 4, 6, we already said we're in the intersection. Look at 8. 8 is in set C, but not in set A. So 8 does not belong. And the intersection of set A and C is simply this set of you know elements 2, 4, and 6. And it's really that simple. Just look for elements that the two sets in question have in common. What are elements that are in both set A and, and again, you see this symbol, think of the word and, set A and set C at the same time. Great. All right, so now the other operation on sets that we're going to see in this video instead of intersection is the union of two sets, which is represented by a different symbol. And I'll write off to the side again what that means. All right. So the same three sets are in question here, A, B, C, and here I'm asked to find the union of sets A and B, or, or A union B, this, this U shape, uh, when you see it involving two sets, means the union of. Okay, so off to the side here, uh, the union, alright, the union of two sets A and B, or A and C, or whatever the whatever they're called, uh, denoted by this symbolism here, with the A U B A union B. Uh, this is itself another set, and what is it the set of? It is the set. 
uh, con consist containing all elements. And, sorry, not enough room there. I apologize. Containing elements that are in either set A either set A or and that's the key word here or when you see this U symbol between two sets you can really think of the word or that are containing elements that are either in either set A or set B or both set A and B. Right. Um, so in another way to say this, uh, another way you might see this re read is that this is the uh, what they call the inclusive or Because um, if I say A union B, you know, this is the inclusive or that means you can be in, you know, either a, an element of A or an element of B or both, right? There's that including both of them at the end. Um, as opposed to, we're not going to see it in this video, but there's a, there's another symbol out there for the exclusive or, which means, you know, you're either in A or you're in B but not both. All right, you can't be in both. You can't be overlapping. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that today. All right, so just the inclusive or, this U symbol is the word, or this inclusive or. I'm, I'm either in set A or set B or both. All right. Okay, so same thing I did with the intersections. I'll do for these unions. A union B, right, or the in, or the union of set A and B is another set. Draw the little curly braces. And then um, I'm going to go through each uh, each set, yeah, the elements of each set, and see if those elements are in set A or in set B or in both. Let's see. Uh, one is in set A, so it's in the union. Remember, if it's in set A, or in set B, it belongs to the union. Or both, right? One belongs to both as well, so it's definitely in the union, right? Two is in set A, so two is in the union. Three is in set A, so it's in set A or set B. Uh, it's in set A, so it's in the union. Four is in set A, so it's in the union. Five is in set A, so it's in the union of A and B. Six is in set A, so it's in the union. Now some of these do belong to both, right? One belongs to both A and B, right? Three belongs to both. Five belongs to both, right? We saw that in the intersection problem, you know, but two, four, and six just belong to A, but that's okay. That's all this means is, you know, you belong to A or you belong to B or both. Uh, let's see, that was through the elements of A. Now we have 1, 3, and 5 in the union already for the elements of B. And then, oh, 7 belongs to B. So 7 belongs to the union. And that's it, right? I've, I've looked at every element of A, every element of B. Close the set. Right. So it's all the elements that are either in A or in B or both. All right, so we got a lot of stuff there. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Great, and I'll box that in. That's my solution. All right, same, uh, same concept, this union. Just remember the union of two sets is this inclusive or symbol, the, the U. You're in either one set or the other set or both if you're in the union. So I have here for part D, look at the same sets up here. Find the union, I right, see the U symbol, of A and C. So remember, if a number or an element is in this set, it'll be an element that's either in set A or it's in set B or it's in both. Very inclusive or. So A union C. 
or the union of A and C is a set of, and again, I'm just going to run through the elements of A first. So you know, all these elements of A are in A. Yeah, some of them are in both as well. 2 is in both A and C, 4 is in both A and C, 6 is in both A and C, but that's okay. Right? As long as you're in A, or you're in C, or you're in both, like the 2, 4, and 6, you are in the union of A and C. So 1 is in the union because it's an A, 2 is in the union because it's an A or C, right? It's in both. 3 is in the union because it's in A, 4 is in the union because it's in A, it's in C, it's in both. Uh, 5 is in the union because it's in A, 6 is in the union because it's in A, and also C, right? or C, or both. Um, so I went through all the elements of A, they're all in the union of A and C, and then all the elements of C, I already have 2 is in there, 4 is in there, and 6 is in there, no need to write them again. But there's also this element 8. 8 is in C, so it belongs to the union. And that's it. All right. Here are all the elements that are in set A or in set C or both. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. And it's really that simple. When there are, you know, finite numbers of elements, right? There's only six elements there, four in there, and four in there. It's, a, it's pretty hopefully easy to see what's going to be in the union or in the intersection of two sets when there's a very small amount of elements. All right, so a couple more involving these sets, and then we'll get to sets where there are infinitely many numbers in them. Right, maybe make it a little more tricky or a little trickier. All right, so part E with these same sets. Now pay attention to the symbol. All right, be careful. They're they're very similar looking, I know, but you know, just this is the upside down U. Right, so remember, this is the intersection. of sets B and C. Right? Or if you want to think of this as, you know, the word and. Right? I'm, what I'm looking for here are only the elements that are in set B and in set C uh, at the same time. Right? But in both of them. Alright, so let's do that. Here's B intersect C. Alright. It's a set, right? So I have a little braces. Now look at the elements of B. One is in B, but not in C. So one is not in the intersection. Three is in B, not in C. Five is in B, not in C. Seven is in B, not in C. So none of the elements in B are in the intersection of B and C. Let's look at the elements of C. Two is in C, not in B. Four is in C, not in B. 6 is in C, not in B. 8 is in C, not in B. So there, if you look at these elements in B and C, they have no elements in common. There are no shared elements. So there are no elements in this set. So one way to symbolize that is simply have nothing in there. Close the set. And this is referred to as the empty set, right? For obvious reasons. There's there's nothing in there, right? So if you just see a couple braces with nothing, with a space between them, nothing in them, uh, this is sometimes just referred to as the empty set, right? There's absolutely nothing there. Uh, now you might also see the empty set symbolized this way if you realize, oh, the, this intersection of B and C has no elements. Uh, you might see the empty set denoted by this, like it's like a circle with a slash through it. So this also represents the empty set, just a set with no elements. But either way, that's what we've got, right? The intersection of B and C is the empty set, right? No, they have nothing in common. There's no element in both B and in C. Great. Now the other way around, it's going to be different, right? Uh, my, la my last part for this these three sets is, you know, let's find B, remember this is the U shape and a different symbol, union with C. Right. So remember this, this means the union of sets B and C. And if you'd like, you can think of this U symbol as the that word or, 
right? And that's again the inclusive or. So what we're looking for here are elements that are in either B or C or both. Right? All right, so the set B union C, the union of B and C is a set. Uh, you know, one is in the set B, so it's in the union, because it's in either B or C. One is in the union, three is in the union, because it's in B, five is in the union, seven is in the union, right? All the elements of B are in the union because they're in either B or C, or both. Um, they're in B. And then all the elements of C are also going to be in the union because they satisfy that I'm in B or I'm in C, right? So 2 is in the union, 4 is in the union because it's in C, and 6 is in the union, 8 is in the union of B and C, and there you go. Right? There is the set, the union of B and C. All the elements that are in either B or C or in both, and there weren't any elements in both, right? but that doesn't matter. We're just putting all the elements that are in either B or C or both. Now you could if you want to. I mean, this is totally fine right here. These are the elements, these are the numbers that belong to this union set. Um, but, you know, very often you'll see that an author will want to put numbers in, in numerical order. So it's, you know, 1 is in the union, then 2, then the next highest is 3, then, you know, this is 1 through 8, basically. 4 is in there, 5 is in there, 6 is in there, uh, 7 is in there, 8 is in there, right? And you got this, it's the same 8 numbers. The, these are the same set. Right? It's just that... I don't know, some, some people tend to like this one better because, you know, the numbers are in numerical order. Okay? Wonderful. All right, so that was a few examples of, you know, intersections and unions where the sets had a finite number of elements, you know, only six, only four, only four. Um, but there are plenty of sets out there that have, you know, infinitely many uh, number uh, elements in them, infinitely many numbers. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's my next example. Let's look at this this scenario where I have these three sets. All right. So this is called a set builder notation, the way these are written. The notation I have with the curly braces and the little bar here, and there's a variable separated by an inequality or some statement. Uh, yeah, this is called set builder notation. I mean, if you haven't seen it in one of my pr prior videos, you know, if, you, if you've been watching, you've seen it. Uh, if not, you know, don't worry about it. You'll see it now. All right. Um, so here I have sets with, you know, infinitely many real numbers, right? We're talking about the set of real numbers, you know, think about the number line. Uh, and I'll be drawing these on a number line in a minute. Right. So suppose set A is the collection of values, right? It's all the values called x, all real numbers, such that, right? This little bar means like such that or as long as x is a number greater than 2. Right? x is a number greater than 2. Um, so for an example here, you know, if, that, if that's my set A, I can tell you a few numbers that belong to A, you know. Uh, you know now, I'll put up another symbolism here. The number 3 would belong to, or is an element of set A. Right? And again, this, this little, looks like a rounded little E, almost like the euro symbol. Uh, when you're talking money, euros, right? Looks like a little E, but rounded. Uh, this means is an element of, or belongs to this set. Right, but th you know, three would belong to A because three is greater than two. It satisfies the condition after the bar. Yeah, I'm just doing some examples. Three belongs to A. Four would belong to A. Five would belong to A. But not just whole numbers, right? Not just whole numbers. You know, any 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 real number greater than two. So you know, two point zero zero one would belong to A, right? And it, that's greater than two. Um, pi, remember pi, that, that's like 3.14159 and so on, it's a little, uh, that's bigger than 2, so that belongs to A. 
Um, you know, E, for those of you out there, this is a number in mathematics. This is about 2.71828. So that's bigger than 2. That belongs to A. And so on. I mean, there, I could, you know, a, a, a thousand belongs to A, a million, a billion, right? Anything greater than 2. All right? So that's all this set builder notation, notation does for us. It just describes, because, you know, there are infinitely many ordered, uh, there are infinitely many numbers in here, infinitely many elements. Uh, you can't possibly list them all, so we describe them instead. All right, so all the numbers greater than 2 are in A. Uh, this set B is all the numbers that are less than 7. Right, so I'm not going to write it this time, but you know, so 6 would belong to B, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, negative 1. All the integers, you know, 6.999, 6.8. Pi belongs to B as well. You know, pi is less than, you know, E is less than 7. E belong, the number E belongs here. Um, negative 0 0.25, negative 1,000, you know, there, there's lots of numbers. Anything, anything less than 7 belongs to set B. And then set C is all the numbers, all real numbers that are less than or equal to negative 3. So negative 3 actually belongs to this set, right? Negative 3 is equal to negative 3, satisfies the or equal to part. Uh, then, you know, negative 3.9, negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, uh, negative pi, negative 18,000, negative 3.257, right? You know, you can, anything less than negative 3 or equal to negative 3 belongs to set C, all right? And I'll draw again. I'll draw pictures of those on the on the real number line represented on the real number line here in a minute. All right. So what we're asked to do in part, my, I have two parts to this. Um, in part A, I'm going to determine A intersect B. Right. Remember, this is the intersection of A and B. What what numbers? What elements? Are in set A and set B at the same time? What do they share? Right? What elements, what numbers are in both set A and set B? All right. So let me take a look. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, it says to graph the set on a real number line and write it in set builder notation. So like I have up here, and something called interval notation, uh, which we'll get to in a second. And again, if you've seen other videos of mine, I've had videos up before on interval notation. Um, so you can look those up or look up other people's videos. Just search for interval notation. I'm sure you can find something because uh, I'm going to kind of brush over it pretty quickly here. All right, so here is the real number line off to the side. All right, so I got this uh, line, and every point on the line, remember, represents a number. Whereas zero in the middle here, and then let's say positives to the right, negatives to the left, and you know if any number is to the left of another number, that number is considered smaller, right? The number on the left is considered smaller. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm looking for the intersection of A and B, where they overlap. Um, what numbers are in both sets? So I'm going to draw them. I'm going to draw set A and set B represent them on my real number line, draw a little graph. All right, so set A has all the numbers greater than 2, right? So 2, let's say 2 is the number here, right? it would be to the right of 0. And all the numbers greater than 2, so not including 2. So I'm going to put a little open point, an open circle. That means 2 is not in there. 2 is not in the set, uh, two, right? Because 2 is not greater than 2, it's equal to 2. And all the numbers greater than 2, right? I mentioned before, 3, 4, 5, all, all the numbers to the right of 2, all those numbers forever. Uh, that is set A, a picture of set A. I'll put a little capital A next to that. All right, then below the number line, I'll draw set B. Uh, set B is, you know, remember, all the numbers less than 7. Now, 7 is to the right of 2, right? 7 is greater than 2. Um, now all the numbers less than seven. So seven itself, okay, I'm not going to put, it, I'm not going to fill that in. An open point, right below seven here. This means that seven is not in the set, and it's you know all the numbers less than seven. So six, five, four, right? All these numbers to the left of seven, all this way forever. That is a picture of set B. The numbers in set B. 
All right, so let's see what what would be in the intersection, right? What numbers would be uh, in both sets? Well, can, hopefully you can see it in my picture. A picture makes it easier when there's infinitely number, infinitely, infinitely many numbers. See all these numbers to the left of two. All the numbers to the left of two belong to B, but not A. So all these numbers to the left of 2 do not belong to the intersection. Same thing for all these numbers up here. To all the numbers to the right of 7, all the numbers greater than 7, belong to A, but not to B. So those don't belong to the intersection. The numbers that do belong to the intersection are all these numbers in here between 2 and 7. Right? The numbers between 2 and 7 are where these graphs overlap. Right? You know, 3 belongs to both, 4 belongs to both, 5 belongs to both, 6 belongs to both, you know, pi belongs to both. You know, 3.89 belongs to both, 6.99 belongs to both. Every number between 2 and 7 belongs to the intersection. Now how about 2 itself? 2 belongs to B, but not to A. Right? We have the open point there. So 2 is not in the intersection. 7, how about the other end? 7. 7 belongs to A, but not to B. Right? So 7 is not in the intersection. All right, so I'm going to write that out underneath here in words. So it looks like from this picture, all numbers between 2 and 7 uh, belong to the intersection. Right? And I notice I didn't say anything about including 2 and 7. Just the numbers between them belong to the intersection, belong to both sets A and B. All right, so I'm going to write that out in, uh, well, so we'll make a graph, right? We'll do all three of these things here. So the graph, so I'm looking at A intersect B. All right, we'll start with a graph. So I'll draw the real number line. There's a real number line. And uh, as I mentioned in words, every number between 2 and 7. Right, I'll throw 0 on here somewhere just so we know where positives and negatives are. But every number between 2 and 7. So there's 2, 7 would be to the right of that. And the graph of A intersect B is going to be represented by you know, all these numbers here but not, not, again, not including 2. So open point above 2, 2 is not included. And not including 7. So an open point or parentheses, you might see some graphs where they put parentheses to indicate an open point to indicate that a number is not part of the set. Right, and there, there's the picture of A intersect B. Right, there's a graph of the intersection of A and B. Um, then we have set builder notation. I'll just write set builder. So it's like these notations up here where uh, I'm going to have A intersect B, right, the intersection of A and B equals the set of you know all real numbers such that, right, so all real numbers X as long as, and then a description. You can write out in words, you could say X is between 2 and 7. Or as a nice compound inequality, a way to write betweenness is that you know x is between, so it's less than and greater than these two numbers. You know, x is, if you're between two and seven, you're greater than two, and at the same time less than seven. So this is a compound inequality to say that the numbers I'm looking at are between two and seven. And there's there's what's called and then I close the set. Right? And there's what's called set builder notation 
for this graph, they describe the same numbers that I did in words over here. Right, and then finally, what's called interval notation, or I'll just write interval. Now there's a see just one piece of the graph here. Notice there's no break. There's no there's no there's no part of the graph that's anywhere else. It's just this one connected piece here, this one segment. So we're going to draw one interval. And the way an interval looks all right, is you start off with the left end point. So is there a lowest end to this interval here, this piece of the graph? Yes. The lowest end of the graph is at 2. Now I know 2 doesn't belong, but you see how the graph doesn't continue beyond it. So two, I, I write the number 2. All right, so we'll do this. We'll say A intersect B equals, and then I write the number 2 for my left end point and then a comma, and then is there a right end point to this piece, a highest value that the graph doesn't go beyond, and the graph doesn't go beyond 7. So the right end point of this graph is 7, so I have 2 comma 7, and then these get capped off. Again, please look up other videos on interval notation if this is unfamiliar to you. And the way that these get capped, you know, if, if, if the left end point is a part of the, of the set, you put a square bracket or a rectangular bracket. Uh, but if it's not part of the set, which it is not, right? Two is not part of the intersection, you put a parenthesis, right? And same thing for seven. Seven is not a part of this set. It's not a part of the intersection. So I put a parenthesis again. So this is called an interval, right? And this, this little two comma seven with the parentheses represents this set here, represents this set here. All three of these things mean the same set of numbers. They're all representing numbers from two to seven, but not including two and seven, right? Everything in between two and seven. Wonderful. All right, so that was an intersection of two sets of real numbers. Um, in my last example today, I have a union of two sets of real numbers, and we're using the same sets, sets A, B, and C up there. All right, so let's slide this in. So same three sets, uh, but we're only working with sets A and C now, and this is a union, see the symbol. All right, I'm determining the union of sets A and C. So again, you can think of this as A or C, with that, that's that inclusive or. So what we're looking for here are all the numbers, all the elements that belong to either set A or set C or both. And it's very inclusive. And then just like before, graph the set on the real number line and write write it in set builder notation and interval notation. And you know all those things, the graph, the set builder notation, the interval notation will represent the same set of numbers. They're all the same thing. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. We're off to the side here. here here's a the real number line. I'll throw a zero on here somewhere. Separate my positives and negatives. And I'll graph. Now we're working with sets A and C this time. Now A we've seen. You know, the number 2 is involved. And it's all the numbers greater than 2. Right? So not including 2 again, an open point or a parenthesis. A parenthesis. And then all the numbers greater than 2. And you know, it's all that, all the way to, all, all the numbers to the right of 2 forever. That's set A. Those numbers are in set A. Set B, uh, C, sorry, set C is this set here. That was all the numbers that include negative 3 and all the numbers less than negative 3. All the numbers less than or equal to negative 3. So negative 3, that would be, that would be over here. And, you know, negative 3 is in the set. So that, I'm going to put a closed point, you know, filled in. This means that negative 3 is in set C. Uh, or you could put a rectangular bracket to indicate that that is in the set. And then all the numbers less than negative 3, so negative 4, negative 5, negative 6. You know, all the numbers to the left of negative 3 are in set C. Okay, so there's a picture of set A, a picture of set C. We're asked to determine what's in the union. All right. 
All right, so I can look at this picture and we can, we can make a graph over here. All right. So again, here's the real number line. Again, I'm throwing zero somewhere. Um, now this is, you know, this is a lot nicer. Right? I'm not looking for an overlap this time like I did with the intersection. If a number is in set A, it's in the union. If a number is in set C, it's in the union. And if a number is in both, it's in the union. Now you can see there's no overlap here. There's no number that's in both of these. But that doesn't matter. Um, so look here. You know, All of these numbers to the right of 2 are in set A. So they're in the union, A union C. So I'm just going to graph that again. All those numbers to the right of 2, those are in the graph of my union. Right? And then all these numbers, you know, negative 3 is in set C. All these numbers less than negative 3 are in set C. And if you're in set C, you're in the union of A and C. So here's negative 3, and I'll put it above this time so they're on the same level. And negative 3 is in set C, so it's in the union. And then all these numbers to the left of negative 3 are in set C, so they're all in the union as well. So here's a picture of uh, my union. Here's a graph of A union C. All these numbers in orange here are red if you're kind of, you know, don't see that, um, are in the, in the union of sets A and C. It's really that simple. So whatever's in one set belongs to the union, whatever's in the other set belongs to the union. Great. Now, uh, now for set builder notation, All right, so I've got A union C equals the set of, you know, all real numbers, and again, I'll call them just X here, such that, and we're just writing them like this, right? Such that, and then I'm just basically putting up this with the word or, right? All just write out what are the elements of set A or the elements of set C, because if you're an element of set A or an element of set C, you're in this set. You're in the union. So A union C is made up of all the numbers that are greater than 2 or less than or equal to 3 or both. But you know, again, the, when you write the word or out in place of this symbol, again, it's implied that it's the inclusive or. So a number that's greater than 2 is in the set or a number that's less than or equal to 3 is in the set, or both, but, you know, again, n no numbers in both. But that's it. Just remembering that this U symbol, this union symbol, represents the inclusive or. All right, and finally, uh, interval notation. Now, you may notice, you know, in my first example, part A, right, there was just the one piece of the graph. There was no other part of the graph anywhere else. There were no breaks in the graph. When I'm writing here interval notation uh, for the set A union C, look at the graph again. You see how now there are two pieces? There's this piece, negative 3 into the left. Then there's a break in the graph, a hole in it. And then the graph continues on. So when there are pieces of the graph, you're going to have to write an interval for each piece. And we're going to just simply connect them with the word or, right? So any element in this set, so again, A union C is equal to, you know, any element, that, any element in this set is either in this, is one of these numbers or the U, right? One of these numbers. So I'll write an interval for these numbers here. Now remember, the interval, you start off writing the left end. You know, is there a left end? Well, no. You know, this is an arrow going, going to the left forever. So to indicate that there's no left endpoint, we're going to write negative infinity. Right? This goes toward negative a million, negative a billion, negative a Google, negative a Googleplex. You know? So write, neg write a concept, you know, negative infinity, to indicate that there's no left endpoint to this interval here. Now the right endpoint is a comma. The right end point of this interval is at negative 3, right? It doesn't go beyond that. There's a gap. There's a hole. There's a space, right? 
So negative infinity comma negative three. Now cap the ends with either parentheses or brackets. Negative infinity is not a number. It is not a real number. It's just an idea. That just means there's no left end, no lowest value. So because it is not a number, you always put parentheses, parentheses on your infinities or negative infinities. And then the negative three, you know, we said earlier, negative three is in the set. You're seeing that in my graph here, right? Negative three is in the set. So to indicate that the right, that right end point is in the set, put this, you know, rectangular bracket. Right, make sure to make little 90 degree angles. You know, try not to rush this because people who tend to rush this make it look like a parenthesis, a parenthesis and, and then you know, that has a totally different meaning. All right, so that's representative of this first part of the graph, right? So any number in A union C is either in this part of the graph or, again, the fancy symbol for or is just that union symbol. So you'll see this quite often in interval notation when there are multiple pieces of the graph. I'm either on this part of the graph or, right, and then the union symbol, this part of the graph. And then we'll, you know, again, draw an interval, write an interval for this part of the graph. Now, is there a left end? Yes, at two. So two comma. And is there a high end or a right end? No. This goes to the right forever. All the numbers greater than two are in this set. So to indicate that there's no right end, no high end, put positive infinity or just the infinity symbol for the right end. All right, and then uh, cap these off, finish the interval. Two, two is not in this set, right? Two is not in the union, right? Because two didn't belong to A or C. Um, so a parenthesis on two, right? To indicate that two is not in the set. And then uh, again, as I said, with negative infinity, positive infinity, that is not a number. That's an idea, that's a concept. That just means that if you go a thousand, a million, a billion, a trillion, you know, you can go to the right forever and those numbers will be in the set. But ne but infinity itself is not a number. So you cannot say it's included in the set. So always parenthesis on the infinities. And there we have it. This is what's called the interval notation for our union here. So any, any number that's in A union C is either in this interval or in this interval, which is again represented by these inequalities here in set builder notation. And those are also represented by this graph here. All three of these things represent the same set of numbers, uh, the, the numbers that are in the union of A and C. Wonderful. All right, so now that I'm done with that, um, you know, just like to say at the end of these, try your best to, you know, learn the material, understand material on your own before you go looking for help. I have found that people you know, tend to remember things better, you know, materials t tends to stick with you better if you've taken the time and effort, put in the blood, sweat, and tears to learn it on your own. Uh, so read the material, of course. Read the author's examples carefully. Um, perhaps even work on the solutions to an, to an author's examples before you see how the author did it and then compare your work to the authors and perhaps you can learn some from some mistakes there. Uh, obviously practice plenty of exercises, plenty of work problems, um, you know, uh, practice problems and, and look up solutions when that, whenever they're made available so you can check yourself, you know, track your progress. And don't just give up after the first approach or the first attempt at a problem, you know, keep at it. But if after you know several approaches, several different ways to try to do a problem and you're, you're not getting it, perhaps you should read through the material again. Because you know after doing some problems, you'll have a better idea, a better grasp as to what the author wants you to do, what you know what the author is looking for, and perhaps on a second or even third more careful and deliberate read through with note taking, you'll see you know, maybe see something that you didn't see the first read through, or you'll catch something, something you'll click that didn't, that didn't the first time. But if after that, you know, if after several read throughs of the material, after several approaches at some problems, you're still not getting it and it's still not clicking in your mind, well, then it is not a sign of weakness whatsoever to go out asking for help. Um, that is what other people are there for. So ask a teacher a tutor, a friend, 
someone in your class who you know knows the material well and is willing to help. Uh, look for supplemental materials online. There's loads of it out there. Uh, look for videos on the subject, such as this one, or, and I assure you, there are loads of other videos out there that are better than the ones I'm putting out, um, and I, I trust you can find them pretty easily. But just keep at it. Just keep practicing. Stay persistent. Don't give up. And try, and as, as, hard, as easy as it is to say, you know, much easier said than done, uh, try to have a positive attitude about the subjects you're studying. Like, I know they can be boring sometimes, and I know you probably had bad experiences with math in the past that made you think you hate it, you hate it, you hate it. Well, if you keep thinking you hate, you're gonna, you hate it, you're going to hate it. And it's just going to make the learning experience that much less enjoyable. So try to go in with an open mind, thinking, I'm going to read this today, I'm going to do this homework today, and I'm going to enjoy it, I'm going to learn something, I'm going to take something away from it that's going to be a positive thing in my life. And just have a positive attitude. It's amazing the difference that a positive attitude can make, a little change in attitude can make. So stay persistent, keep practicing, stay positive, don't give up, and uh, I just know you're going to get it. All right, just put in that time. And thank you very much for watching.